Hi, my name is Helen Schwartz, and welcome to Absolutely Orchids. Did you ever wonder where all the orchids come from and how they get to be big orchids from little orchids? Well, if I didn't know better, I'd swear that they were human because they have all kinds of ways to get insects to pollinate them. And here today to show us that is Ruben Saluda. He's a renowned taxonomist and he has a, a flasking business which is world known and he's going to show us now what these little insects do to make new babies. One of the most interesting things about orchids, one of the most interesting aspects of growing orchids and of seeing what they do is in their pollination mechanisms. Almost all orchids are pollinated by insects and the way they attract insects uh, is through mimicry and they will mimic other plants, they mimic other insects, they have all kinds of, of mimicry and, and deception in many cases uh, to deceive insects to come and pollinate them. One of the most interesting that, uh, parts that I've worked with was this particular, uh, on this particular slide here, is a little bug called, it's a little um, moth called Limeyer Edwards eye. And we were in the uh, Fakahatchee, the Fakahatchee is out in the Everglades, and we were out there observing one of our native orchids, which is what's pictured there, is uh, Epidendrum anseps. And we noticed that this little bug, this little uh, moth, would come usually around 9 o'clock every night and look for nectar. It would go in and try to pollinate, and actually would pollinate the flower. And we noticed one thing that was very interesting, that only males came to the flower, no females. So we were wondering if there are only males in this population. So we set up black lights out in the middle of the, of the Fakahatchee, which is kind of weird in the middle of the night. Black lights are, are actually uh, ultraviolet lights that attract insects. So we set them up to see if there were only males in the population. It turns out there were as many females as males in the population. So then we started, really got interested with this and started to try to figure out why the insect comes to the flower and what it does and why it's only males. And here you can see in the picture, this is Limeyer Edwards' eye. He's on the uh, epidendrum, uh, this is the insect here. He's on the epidendrum anseps, the flower right here, and it's a cluster of flowers. And you can see he has landed on the flowers and he's trying to stick his proboscis. His proboscis is his feeding tube that he uncoils and puts it into the flower. And what he does is he goes from flower to flower. Let me change slides here. Okay, as you can see on this slide, the insect has landed on the, he's moved around, and here's this proboscis he's uncoiling right here and trying to stick it into the flower. In the next set, next slide, you can see that he is pulling it out, and there's the anther cap stuck to his proboscis right there. And then what, he, what happens is, when he pulls it out, the pollinia sticks to his proboscis, he goes to the next flower, puts it in, pollinates the flower. When he pulls his proboscis out, he picks up another set of pollinia. Now our question was why was he doing this and why only males? So we started uh, checking to see what else he fed on. And we found out that he feeds, that uh, there's, there's a weed called uh, Eupatorium. It's a common weed out in the Everglades. And this weed is, is an annual and it dies. And when it dies, it usually falls over and uh, on the root, we were noticing that the insect was coming to the roots, the same male of, of this uh, species was coming to the roots of the dead Eupatorium. And we could see that he, there was a crystalline material there. And what he would do was he would regurgitate up stomach fluids, put this crystal back into solution, and then swallow it. And as it turns out, this was a very long, drawn-out project, as you can imagine, but it turns out that he was going, he was attracted to the Eupatorium. There's a compound in the Eupatorium, and he's attracted to it. As the compound breaks down, it produces a volatile part, which he can smell, and that's what attracts him. And then he would take this, this fluid, this uh, crystal, which he had regurgitated, and then he, that was necessary in order for the females to lay their eggs. We traced the compound from the male to the female. And we're trying to figure out how it got to the male, but by doing, uh, but to the female, by doing a, a tracer, it was ca being carried out when they, when they copulated in the spermatophores. But they, instead of, of loose sperm, they have a packet, which the male gives to the female, and that compound was in that packet. And then the female, if she didn't have that, she couldn't lay the eggs. Now, what the anseps does, what does this have to do with the orchid? Well, the anseps, the compound, the fragrance of this orchid, is a chemical mimicry of the fragrance that is produced by the eupatorium to attract the insect. So, uh, but it's not exactly the same chemical, it's, it's a mimic. It's almost the same chemical. So the, the, um, the anseps, the epidendrum anseps, attracts the insect by mimicking this compound. The insect comes looking for those crystalline, for that material, and he's probing around looking for it, and in the process, that's how he pollinates this flower. 
Another interesting thing too, orchids go through great uh, uh, trouble to prevent inbreeding. So if he, when he goes to the flower, he will pollinate every single flower. But nothing will take unless he brought a pair of pollinia with him from a flower he visited before. So only the first flower he visits on each head of flowers will actually produce a seed pod. Otherwise, you'd have all these pods there, and they were all inbred. They were all selfings. The insect does that. That's something that's not really tolerated in orchids, inbreeding. So only the one he brought with him from the previous visit is the one that works on there. And we finally worked this out. It was a number of universities involved in this project to figure this out. We had to follow them to see the behavior, what they were doing, and why. And it, uh, it was a very interesting project. But it's, uh, it's really incredible how the orchids can mimic and take advantage. This is a very close and elaborate coevolution, is what it really is, coevolution between insects and, uh, and uh, orchids and plants. Here, here's a, a shot, a close-up of the pollinia on him right there. See, there's the pollinia. He's rolled up his proboscis, and the pollinia is stuck to him right here. When he goes into the next flower, he will deposit that pollinia and pick up a new pair. And he goes from flower to flower doing that. But only the pair he brought with him is the one that will work. The others will not work because the plant is not self-compatible. There are many of these mechanisms that have not been worked out that we have no idea why. Here's another one of our native orchids. This is uh, Encyclia tempensis. And here is the, the pollinator. It's a megachylid bee. And it's only females that visit the flowers. Why, we have no idea. We haven't figured this one out, but it's only females. The problem with this kind of research takes a lot of money and a lot of time. Uh, but here she is uh, entering the flower. And you'll see that each orchid basically has one insect that pollinates it perfectly. There sometimes will be uh, accessory pollinators, but only one does it perfectly. You can see she fits exactly perfect inside. Here's the, there are two little uh, appendages here, and she, her head fits perfectly inside those appendages. And she's looking for nectar. She has pushed the, lip, the labellum down. She's pushing her way in there and looking for nectar. There's no nectar in there. So we're not sure why she's doing it. She's looking for nectar, but it's just not there. Uh, the orchid is deceiving this pollinator to come in and do it. Now, when she pulls out of there, she'll, the pollinia will stick right between her eyes. Now, here she is. There's the pollinia stuck right between her eyes. And this really bothers her. And she will uh, try and take it off, but she can't. It's in, a, it's in a spot on her head where she can't reach it. It's in just the right spot on her head. She cannot reach it. She'll be very annoyed. She'll keep trying to knock it off. And she gets so annoyed, she leaves. And she will not visit uh, that plant again for a while. So meanwhile, she finds another one in the wild, maybe an hour or two later, and she goes and pollinates. She does the same thing again. They have a short memory. Uh, so they go back. She'll go back and do it again. And then she's carrying the pollinia. So the first flower she visits, when she goes in, she'll, she'll deposit the pollinia and pick up a new pair on the way out. And this is how the, or this particular orchid gets pollinated. And this is how it prevents from uh, inbreeding, from being selfed, so that it's assured that it's being crossed one with another one. Here is another one of our native orchids. This one is pollinated by a wasp. There are a number of insects. There are, there are uh, mostly bees that do the pollinating, but wasps will do it, butterflies do it, um, and then we get into birds, too, which I'll show you in a few minutes, that it will actually pollinate flowers, too. This is a wasp going into a epine uh, what's now called Anachilium cochleatum. used to be uh, Epidendrum cochleatum. used to be Encyclia cochleata. Now it, the proper name is Anachilium. And all it does is just come around in here, comes around to the front, sticks its head, picks up the pollinia, and then leaves. We don't understand the behavior, but in a lot of these, we have no idea why they do it. Uh, they, we, you have to study the, the other behavior of the animal, what it's doing in the wild, to be able to understand why it's coming to the orchid. Here's a, an interesting um, orchid that is, it looks like a lelia. It looks like one of our Brazilian uh, species, but this is actually a Southeast Asian species. It's terrestrial. It's about as far away as you can get from the lelias and from the catleas. It's totally in the other side of the, of the orchid family, and yet it looks almost identical, and I can take this flower off the plant and show it to people and ask them what it is, and they'll usually say, well, it's a new lelia or it's a new catlea or, or something in that, in that uh, group, and yet it's the genus Pleione, a terrestrial. And the reason this looks so much, this is what we call convergent evolution. Um, this is the only way that this flower could look in order to be pollinated by a particular bee that is its pollinator. And you'll see that this is a very common theme throughout the orchid world, flowers that look like this with a tubular lip. And like I said, this is the genus Pleione. This is a Vanda, 
And here you can see it has a, a landing platform. Again, this is a bee pollinated flower. It has a landing, nice landing platform for the bee to land. And the bee will stick its head right in this area right in here. So this is a large bee that pollinates this. You can see by the size of this. And it will look for nectar. It can't find any usually. So when it pops out its head, the pollinia will stick on the back of its head. Uh, the anther cap is right here, and there's a little sticky appendage right there, which will stick to the insect. The insect will come out of the flower, go to the next flower, and it goes in, the pollinia will stick to the stigmatic surface, and then a new pair of pollinia will, will come out when the insect backs out of it. And this is a very common pollination mechanism. One interesting thing is that usually each species of orchid has its own pollinator, its own bee that pollinates it. You can have 10 species growing on one tree of, let's say, encyclias and you will not get hybrids because each one has its own bee that pollinates and they can tell the difference between the others and they will just go in and pollinate that one and not bother the other species that are right there next to it on the same tree. Every now and then you find something that, that makes a mistake and you do get natural hybrids but that's rare actually in, in nature. This is a lady slipper here and what they have done, the lady slippers have done, have a, a very ingenious uh, mechanism where they have developed where there's only one way into the flower and one way out of the flower. So that the insect can only go in where the anther cap is, pick up the pollinia, and then come out where the uh, stigma is and, de and, and deposit the pollinia uh, in, in one way. There's hairs in there that actually prevent the insects from going in the wrong way. The hairs are pointing up in, in one part and pointing down in the other. Where they're down, the insect can go in. Once it gets inside the, uh, inside the pouch right here, he cannot get out, and with it, he can't go back out the same way he came in. He has to go out uh, through the front where, this, where the stigmatic surface is. I have a, a live flower here that'll be easier to, to uh, see it on. This is the pouch right here. The insect enters from the side. In the front of the pouch, there are hairs pointing up. So if he lands in the front, he cannot go right into the front. He has to work his way around and come in through the side right in through here. Now, there are, th these orchids are very primitive, and they actually have two anthers. All of the orchids I've shown you up to now have a single anther at the tip of the column. But these have two anthers, so the insect has two ways to go in. He can either go from this side or from this side. And then once he gets in there, though, there are hairs pointing down on the side. So he has to come up the front where the hairs are pointing up. And he crawls out through the front. The stigmatic surface is, is right underneath this structure right here. And that way he self-pollinates the flower. These are very primitive. And they don't mind being self-pollinated, I guess. Uh, uh, they, they have other ways of preventing uh, genetic defects and so on. So they're uh, really very primitive orchids. These are so considered some of the most primitive of, of the orchids uh, that we have. Very interesting mechanism, though. Now, here we get to one of my favorites, because um, th this is one of the most evolved mechanisms that, that I have seen. Uh, these are the genus Catacetums. And Catacetums have male and female on separate plants. In other words, a plant that is in a lot of light, let's say up high in the trees, will have female flowers. A plant that is lower in the canopy with more shade will have male flowers. Now, these bees normally fly low in the canopy. They find this, this, these are male flowers here. They find this flower open and they will land on the lip. The lip is this part right in here. They land right on this and they actually take their hind legs and they start scraping the surface. These cells on the surface have a narcotic compound on them. The insect ingests it and gets drunk. Actually starts kind of wobbling around uh, drunk on this lip. Now there's a trigger here. You can hardly see it there. There's a trigger that comes down. If the insect touches that trigger, the pollinia, which is up here, comes flying at him under very, uh, a pretty fast velocity, hits the insect, sticks to him, and knocks him off the flower. Now, this, this bee lands usually on the ground because he's drunk to start with. Now he has all this pollinia on him, too. So he's drunk. He gets very upset. Now, some bees, when they get upset, they fly straight up. Other bees fly to the ground and sit on the ground. The bee that pollinates this is one that gets very upset and flies straight up. So what it does is it goes straight up to the top of the trees, sits there for a little bit, gets its bearings, and then goes back to pollinating. But what it, what it finds up at the top of the tree it, are the female flowers. The female flowers look totally different from this. If they look like this, he wouldn't go back to it. Because after that shot in the head that he took from the pollinia, he's not going back to this flower. But the female flower looks totally different. So he goes into the female flower, deposits the pollinia, 
uh, in there. And when he comes out, he, he leaves the polynia behind. And then eventually he goes back and does it again. They have a short memory. They go back and, and uh, do it again, uh, getting drunk and getting knocked off the flower and the whole, the whole procedure. But it's really, when you stop and consider the, the years of evolution and how difficult this complex this mechanism is uh, to, to develop our narcotic compound, to develop a trigger, that, and, and he has to be in just the right spot when he triggers it so that the pollinia will come flying at him and hit him just in the right spot. If it hits him in the wrong spot, when he goes into the female flower, he will not deposit the pollinia on uh, the stigmatic surface. So everything has to be just perfect in order for it to happen. There are many species of orchids that are pollinated by hummingbirds, and this is the genus Bretonia from Jamaica, and it has uh, the character, typical characteristics of a hummingbird pollinated flower. The first thing is that they're red, and almost all of the flowers that are pollinated by hummingbirds are red. Um, there, there's another interesting story, too, with this, that in Australia, there are a lot of flowers that are red and look like similar to this that are pollinated by birds, but not hummingbirds. They're pollinated by birds that mimic hummingbirds. So these hummingbirds, these birds are mimicking hummingbirds. The orchids are mimicking food that the hummingbirds normally eat out, eat out of in order to get pollinated. So it's, it's, it gets more complex all the time. But typical red flower, it has a yellow spot to uh, guide the hummingbird into the flower. And when he puts his beak in through there, he will, he's, he's looking for nectar. The orchid does not have any nectar in this case either. But he thinks there's nectar. So when he pulls his beak out, the pollinia sticks to him. And when he goes to the next flower, puts his beak in there, he deposits the pollinia that he picked up and picks up a new pair and just goes from flower to flower pollinating them. This is the genus Notelia and we went from the catacetums which were so complex with the narcotic compound and so on to a very simple mechanism. These things really smell uh, strange and they attract flies. I'm not going to say they smell bad, but they smell strange. They attract flies, and the fly just lands on it and walks around on it. And this thing will be covered with flies in the wild. And the flies are just walking around, and eventually one of them will stick its legs just in the right place, and pollination occurs. I mean, this is the total opposite of, uh, from complexity to, to a very simple pollination mechanism, which is quite effective because the amount of flowers are involved and the amount of flies that are out there that will come to this when it's in bloom. This is the uh, genus Angrecum. And angrecums are all pollinated by sphingid moths. Sphingid moths are moths that hover, that do not land at all. They fly very, very fast, just zo zo uh, zoom around and pollinate these flowers. Um, this is the one that Darwin discovered and, and, uh, and uh, had, had, had his hypothesis of what pollinated it, and it turned out to be true. And I can show you, here is the, uh, the plant, the live plant. And you can see this has a very long spur that hangs down. And the nectar is in this spur. And the moth that, that pollinates this is it's about six inches. And it will hover out here, uncoil its proboscis, its feeding tube, stick it in through there, and actually pull the nectar out of here. And they actually hover. And we have one of our native orchids, the uh, ghost orchid, as we call it, does the same thing. It has the same pollinator that actually hovers, some large moth that hovers out here. And you can see there's the, uh, the anther cap is right here. The moth, when he sticks his proboscis in, uh, he comes in contact with the anther cap, and when he pulls it out, the pollinia sticks to him. When he goes to the next flower, it, he does the same thing. The pollinia is, is stuck onto the stigmatic surface. Pollination has occurred. And you can see by the length of the spur, many times you can tell what size the, the, the insect is that's going to pollinate it. Um, some of the flowers have very short spurs, uh, like the, the one on the slide is, is a much slower, much shorter spur, and it's pollinated by a much smaller spinged moth. Okay, when we get the, here you can see this one has a much shorter spur here. So the moth that pollinates this is only probably about three inches across. So you can actually tell the size of the moth. These are all night pollinated. They have, they produce fragrance at night or early and very early in the afternoon. Some spinged moths uh, fly at night, late at night. Others fly early in the afternoon, like from six o'clock till about seven or eight. So all of these orchids, another interesting point too, all of these orchids that are fragrant produce their fragrance when they're gonna be pollinated. And you can actually do a, an analysis of when the orchid is fragrant, and then you can tell when it's gonna get pollinated. So you don't have to be out all day watching for a pollinator. You can just watch for one day, do a graph of when it peaks, and you know that when it peaks, if it's nine o'clock at night, that's when it's gonna get pollinated. That's when the most of the insects will be there, and most of the pollination will occur is at nine o'clock at night. There are some large carnivorous 
um, uh, predatory wasps that feed on other insects. And one of the insects that they feed on are uh, spiders. And one of the interesting thing about um, insects, they can see into the infrared range of light. And what, what we are looking at here, like this is the, the live uh, uh, flower, the insect sees something very different. What it sees here is a spider sitting there which we cannot quite see, but it does. And this wasp will come and grab this flower, and thinking it's a wasp, it's a, a spider, it will grab it and try to fly away with it. And what they do is they, they sting the, uh, the spider, and they take it to their nest underground. These are all underground uh, dwellers, and they lay their eggs in these spiders. And then the eggs, of course, hatch, and they have something to eat. And the, the wasp is trying to fly away with this flower, and in the process, it hits the anther cap here and pollinates the flower. This is the genus Epidendrum, and many of the Epidendrums have their lips rolled down and back under. As you also have, you can see these two ridges here. This is to guide the insect. These are pollinated by small spinged moths, which hover just uh, a few inches from the flower. They uncoil their proboscis, and they stick it right through there, and this guides them into it. And as they fly out, they will usually fly up a little bit as they fly out. Their proboscis will go right into this. There's a little notch in here, and the anther cap will, the anther, the pollinia will stick to them, and the anther cap will fall off. And they'll go from flower to flower doing this as, uh, as, as they go along. Here's another epidendrum. This is one of our native orchids also. And same type of flower. You see how the lip is kind of rolled under? to give the moth a chance to hover in front of the flower, and he uncoils the proboscis, puts it in through the tube into here, and then tries to get nectar from behind, be inside the flower, but there's really no nectar. In most cases, the, orchid, the, the insects do not get a reward from the orchid. This, uh, this is an orchid that is uh, native here to South Florida, and it is not pollinated by any insect, because the insect that normally pollinates this is no longer in Florida. And what has happened is Florida is the northernmost uh, point at which this species occurs. Now, when you go into Central and South America, where this species also occurs, this is Epidendrum rigidum, there is a pollinator for it there. But in Florida, there is no pollinator. So what the orchid has done is developed a mechanism of self-pollination without an insect. And it actually uh, produces the stigmatic fluid on the stigma, actually overflows and becomes in contact with the pollinia. The pollinia germinates and fertilization occurs. Pollination and fertilization occurs without uh, an insect present because there is no insect. And you'll find in many species of orchids, if you go out and you look at a large population of orchids, you'll find there's always a few individuals that can do this. So if the insect disappears, eventually the population will shift from po insect pollinating to self-pollinating. This is it's not that common, though. So at one time, there probably were hundreds of species in Florida that have disappeared because of the changing climatic conditions. Uh, sometimes just a, a two or three degree change in temperature over a period of time will drive the insect out. The insect will actually be gone from an area. And if, and the, if the orchid does not have the pollinator, then that's the end of that orchid. This last slide is of a uh, cymbidium. This is a hybrid. And it's kind of for people that aren't too sure of where to pollinate the flower. You'll notice that there's an arrow pointing to the anther cap right there. So that people that don't know how to do it can uh, have the, the, uh, know exactly where to go to do it. Well, uh, wasn't that interesting? I find that totally fascinating. Sometimes I do believe these orchids are human, and they think, and they attract these insects. Well, thanks a lot, Reuben, and maybe we'll do this again sometime. My pleasure. Until next time, get growing.